Welcome back, everyone. In this video, we are going to be learning about the fourth and final stage of wound healing remodeling. What happens after everything else is done? How can we get back to making it look like normal? So remodeling, which is also called maturation phase, starts about three weeks after injury. So remodeling starts while the other stages are still ongoing. Um, so referring back to the third stage in the proliferative phase where we are laying down collagen, we have all those fibroblasts giving us collagen, those collagen molecules are just kind of like haphazard laid down. It's like, here's some collagen, take care of it. And so what we have to do now is we have to remodel the collagen. And so what happens to the collagen molecules if there is tension? Okay, like we have no tension on our skin this way, but we have tension on our skin in other directions. The collagen molecules are going to line themselves with the lines of tension. In addition, extra fluid that's in the tissue can be reabsorbed, and that allows the collagen fibers to lie next to each other, and that allows easier linkage to happen between them, which is really going to condense down the wound as well. Um, and decrease the thickness of the scar. Now, this also is going to make the wound stronger, but you have to realize it's not going to have the same strength as uninjured wound. And I'll be talking more about that in our last video, the one that comes right after this one. So just remember, during this remodeling, we still have proliferation going on. So we're producing collagen and breaking it down and realigning it, doing all that at the same time. And hopefully Shazam, at some point, the wound is completely closed, okay? And so when we see that wound completely closed and remodeled a little bit, so it's a little bit narrower than it was earlier. If you look at both of these pictures, you'll see that the epidermis or the epithelial layers are not normal. They're thicker than normal and they don't have the normal um, anatomy yet. So there's still a lot more remodeling that's going to be going on besides just the wound being completely closed. Cells that we no longer need, such as macrophages, such as all the fibroblasts that were laying down collagen, those cells are going to undergo apoptosis, that program cellular death process we've talked about earlier. Um, it's important to realize that the scar you have is not the scar you're going to end up with. And there's many things that you can do to help the scar remodel over time. Um, talk to, you know, if you got a scar on your face, talk to your plastic surgeon about, you know, keeping the sun away from it and um, topical things that you can put on it to help encourage more remodeling um, and realize that for any scar anywhere on your body, it's going to be remodeling for at least a year, if not two years. And that's what's going to determine the scar's final quality. Because if you look at scars that you got as a kid, they're like little white lines and they're very neat and beautiful, as opposed to a scar you may have from an operation that only happened a couple of years previously. So let's look in more detail about, about some of the things that are happening. The macrophage, okay? So now the monocytes that have macrophages still hanging around, they're changing their role, okay? Now they're going to become phagocytic again, um, and they're trying to get rid of extra cells that aren't needed there anymore. And so, you know, hopefully we can go back into that kumbaya homeostasis phase. Fibroblasts, myofibroblasts have a definite role in making the wound smaller, which has a definite role in getting a whole epithelial layer covering the wound. Okay, so when the tissue was injured, the fibroblasts in the tissue became activated, you know, cytokines, all that kind of stuff. And as I talked previously, we had myofibroblasts generated. Okay. And the myofibroblasts, because they had actin and they have contractile molecules, they were actually able to contract and constrict the molecule. Um, the fibroblasts, you know, helped that because the fibroblasts held stuff into place so that the myofibroblasts could do their job. 
So both of those working together in concert, you could have a beautiful wound closure as we see going down here on the left and we get resolution and we have the apoptosis um, and we end up with a beautiful wound. So the fibroglasts are generating the traction, the myofibroblasts are doing the contractile forces and then the macrophages come in and the phagocytose, anything that's not needed, they'll get rid of extra extracellular matrix if there's that hanging around as well. Now, when things don't go quite mm -hmm. as planned, like for instance, if we have lack of nutrition, if we have lack of oxygen, if we have poor um, wound vascularity, if we have decreased angiogenesis, if we have new trauma, the, if we have too many myofibroblasts doing their thing, all of those things will lead to increase in tissue scarring. And the more tissue scarring you have, the less normal function you're gonna have of those tissues and the more um, abnormal it's going to look. Let's talk about mast cells for a moment. We talked about mast cells very early on in the first stage of wound healing where we had release of histamines. Um, there were also release of proteases that can help prevent infections and break down tissues. And we also had mast cells releasing cytokines um, like the vascular endothelial growth factors. And so that was really important when it came to having um, fluid go into the acute wound and having an influx of neutrophils. But mast cells also play a role in the later stages when we're talking about remodeling um, because they are going to release growth factors as well. And so we're gonna have more proliferation of fibroblasts, which is gonna give us more myofibroblast differentiation. And in addition, it also releases um, growth factors, which are gonna help stimulate re-epithelialization. So it's important not only in the first three days, but also much later on. Um, and in fact, when we have problems with too much scarring, as I talked about before, we have too many myofibroblasts, too much fibroblast, and we think it's the fault of the mast cells. And we think when chronic wounds aren't healing, that's also the fault of the mast cells. Because when we look at diabetic wounds, we see that they don't have as many mast cells as healthy tissue has. And so they're not releasing all the cytokines that normal healthy tissue does. So mast cells can be good. Lack of mast cells is bad, but too much mast cell activity is also going to give you abnormal scarring. Let's talk about a couple other cells we haven't talked very much about, and those are our dendritic cells and our T cells. So we, you know we have dendritic cells in the dermis, and we also know in the skin we have a dendritic cell known as a Langerhans cell that's cruising around in the epidermis um, looking for work as well. Um, so talking first about the dermis, the dendritic cells in the dermis, uh, when the skin is wounded into the dermis, those dendritic cells are going to be releasing um, interferon and Basically, that's going to stimulate the whole inflammatory process. Um, normally, when there isn't anything much happening, those dendritic cells, basically, when they see a little something, something, they'll send messages and that will activate helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells that are in the lymph nodes draining that area. Um, so they become more active there. Um, your lymphoid nodule becomes larger. Um, and you have a robust immune response and lymph nodes. Yeah. So that will also occur here at the time of a wound. And so, yes, that's also important to the acute inflammatory response and keeping things localized and not having bacteria and other um, bad things enter the circulation. Now in the epidermis, our lovely little Langer hands, you know, you can see this one on the left, it sees this little virus. Um, it's going to react to them. It's going to become the main antigen presenting cell to give us some T cell immunity going on. 
So when we have T cells in the epidermis, they're gonna be releasing some growth factors. Um, basically, there's two different categories here. It's not important that you know them, but basically one type of um, release is gonna be pro-inflammatory. Okay? And the other type of release is actually going to be activating other T cells and other inflammatory cells. So it'll activate the natural killer cells bring them into the air to become part of the party and help get rid of any um, pathogens that might be in the area and as well activates the cytotoxic T cells so they can do their release. You know, as both of these have in common, they're both going to be um, acting via perforin and granzymes. Okay. Um, and they also can migrate to the draining lymph nodes and activate cells there as well. When we actually look at what's going on in the dermis versus the epidermis, what's interesting is the T cells that are in the epidermis are those cytotoxic T cells. Okay? They're at the point of entry. That's, that's why they're in the epidermis. Well, down in the dermis, the T cells that we have hanging out down there, they are the helper T cells, keeping an eye out on everything. And with that, we are done with the last stage of wound healing, and we're going to come back and close down this fascinating topic by talking about healing time. So hope to see you shortly for this last topic.